thank you very much for tuning in. Welcome to the show. And things are heating up as me and Ray Turner hit the top 30, respectively, of our lists, the top 50 sci-fi movies. Ray once again has sent me his list for the week, including notes, and I can tell you, pretty impressive notes, some really great insights into his pick, maybe proving that he is the real cinema professor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so the show goes out once again to Ray, and some, some really interesting picks this week coming up. We're going to do numbers 30 to number 21, and... Of course, you're free to get involved in the conversation again. You can text 07399085508 or you can email studio at beyondradio.co.uk if you want to get involved and comments on the lists. And yeah, you can pick some of your own favourite sci-fi movies as well. And coming up later on, me and Ray also have got our, our latest TV movie of the week for the week um just actually a note from last week speaking of star trek because i made a bit of a schoolboy error my my 31 was of course star trek for the voyage home but i got got characters muddled up because it is in fact Chekhov looking for nuclear vessels in new york or vessels if you like so it wasn't sulu so i got characters muddled so Check off not Sulu, just to correct my error from last week. So that was my 31, so we're up to number 30. And I'll start with Ray's list, actually, his number 30. Um, and we get into the stage where there's quite a few crossovers, and it's quite interesting to to see, you know, placings and the differences. But actually, this is one film I've not had so far. This is Ray's number 30. It is Under the Skin by Jonathan Glazer from 2013. Didn't realise it had been so long. Scarlett Johansson in the lead. And it's from the director of Sexy Beast and Birth. But Ray says he does the opposite of every other director as he started with mainstream films and moved to this, which is quite strange. It's a straightforward story of an alien harvesting people for an unspecific reason, maybe food, maybe research. Scarlett Johansson is disguised as a human and gradually she gets more and more humanity until by the end of the film she is on the run from her own race because she won't go through with the murders anymore. The joy of the film is trying to work out how much of what we are watching is real and how much is symbolic. It's a very uneasy film to watch. The child left on the beach and the disfigured man being led to his death. The film feels almost documentary-like and much of it was filmed with hidden cameras. The people and the locations look very real and it makes you feel how fake extras are in most films. In the middle of these real people is a Hollywood A-list celebrity, so she is really, so she really does feel like an alien. When you watch it, when you watch it, you probably feel that you are watching a masterpiece, partly because it's slightly unfathomable, Great right up there, and to add to what Ray was saying about the film, I remember around the time of its release, when they were filming it, I remember stories of, because it's all shot in, I think it's Glasgow, one of the big Scottish cities anyway, and I remember stories of Scarlett Johansson sort of wandering about and supposedly not being recognised, which is quite quite remarkable. But yeah, there's this sense you have this A-list star sort of playing with her identity, playing with themes of sort of celebrity and isolation and themes like that. Very interesting film, almost like a reversal of the gender the roles that we got in a film like The Man Who Fell to Earth from the 70s. So different take on that sort of setup but that's Ray's number 30 my number 30 and it's a Telly and Gilliam film one of his most loved and that's Brazil from 1985 technically a Christmas film as well I have to say but this is Gilliam's dreamlike surreal version of um, 
1984, or maybe a Kafkaesque fable. With Jonathan Price in the lead role, he plays a man searching for a woman who appears to him in his dreams during his mind-numbing, low-paying job. So it's not only a powerful satire on class, capitalism, and the emerging technology, but it's also a film, I think, which is full of life and imagination. It's Gilliam at his most inventive, playful best, with quirky characters, arresting visuals, and fun riddles. Price anchors the film, he gives this really energetic, sort of hopeful performance, but also gets across the desperation and the bleakness of the character. And you get nice cameos from the likes of De Niro, who they cheekily stuck on the poster, making some people think he was the lead. Michael Palin, Bob Hoskins and Ian Holm all make cameo appearances. And I guess you could say it's a dystopian nightmare sort of mixed with like this more playful sort of dreamlike fairy tale logic. But really impressive film. Maybe not quite the masterpiece some say it is, but really good nonetheless. Brazil is my number 30. And Ray's number 29, which is a film I had last week as well, so he has it a little bit higher on his list. It is Children of Men, the Afonso Caron, based on the P.D. James novel. It's He says it's a believable vision of the future where all hope for the future of humanity is lost. People have become infertile and no one has been given but has given birth sorry, for 18 years. Britain has become totally insia and rounds up um, and rounds up and the persecutes. Per, per, uh, I'm not sure what that word is. Sorry, Ray refugees. There is a resistance group called the the fisheries fishers who find a refugee who is pregnant but wants to steal her baby and use it to inspire a revolution. The story is about how some people see the baby as a human being to be helped. There's a kind of religious slash Jesus quality about the baby. It is obvious, obviously the savour of the human race, but also inspires a massive amount of violence and killing. The resistance group called the Fishers could be a clue to the Christian symbolism. The title is a quote from the Bible, which I didn't know. I was wondering where they got the title from. Scored by John Tavalier and commissioned for the film. So there you have it. Impressive insights once again. Children of Men is um, raised number 29. So on to my 29. Well, interesting contrast because last week Ray had the 1950s version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and my 29 is the 1978 version of the same story, which, in my opinion, is slightly better. Philip Kaufman directs, and it's more of a slow-burning, sort of paranoid thriller, very sort of character-driven. Um, it does a really great, great job of updating the original's themes, it has this real sense of dread and tension throughout with paranoia, as I said, creeping in. Some smart direction. I really like the shot of where you have the scene of Donald Sutherland's character and Brooke Adams when they're in the car and all this chaos is breaking out around them. There's an outbreak and there's this beautiful shot of them watching from their car and we get like the back shot of them. So it's like we're watching them watching sort of thing. Really effective sort of shot. Um, and yeah, excellent cast as well. I really love Leonard Neroy sort of almost playing up his Spock persona. Um, you have Jeff Goldblum, quite a young Jeff Goldblum, and a pre-alien Veronica Cartwright. So really good cast. One or two silly moments and rough effects which maybe haven't aged so well. The man's head on the dog, for example. But otherwise, really great. I think without those moments, it could be either higher, even higher, sorry. But really impressive. I like it a lot. That's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And Ray's number 28 
is another film I had last week, and that's Arrival by Dennis Villeneuve. So again, he has it a little bit higher. Amy Adams in the lead role, as I said last week. Jeremy Reiner there, Forrest Whitaker, really good supporting cast. And he simply says, smart, nice twists and turns, interesting take on the power of communication. Opening is like a Terrace Manic film, which, yeah, I agree, actually. I didn't think of that. Lots of disconnected shots and voiceover. So that's Ray's number 28, Arrival. My number 28, it's a pretty biggie here. It's Spielberg. It's Close Encounters of the Third Kind from 1977. So I've talked about this a fair bit on the show before. Um, So it's sort of a more arty and subtle Spielberg type film, impressive visuals, characters, really dense language. And it really appeals to the imagination so much, which really most of Spielberg's best films does. So it's quite a unique film, quite a unique take on the alien invasion film. So that's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, my number 28. Ray's number 27, and again, it's another one I've had, but he's got it much higher. Fantastic Voyage from 19... Nine, sorry, 1966. Some really interesting notes again from Ray. So here we go. Really good idea for a film. Uh, shrink a submarine and crew to go inside a human being to do surgery, but they have to complete it and get out within one hour or they will start to crow again. It happens in real time. Once they are shrunk, it is actually one hour of the film until they start to grow again. I timed it. Of course you did, Trey. Um, epitome of silly 60s sci-fi, but so much fun. Full of great set pieces going through the air and so everyone outside of the body has to be totally silent but someone drops a pair of scissors having to stop the heart to go through it Ra- Raquel Relsh attacked by antibodies they resisted the need to rip her, her wet suit off <laughs> the antibodies eating the submarine at the end raise on fine form Before it was made, Fox announced that it would be the most expensive sci-fi science fiction film ever made. Flushier, the director, studied medicine and human anatomy before he became a director. Um, Isaac Ashenoff wanted to write the novel based on the script and was, was given permission but because of delays in filming he finished and released the novel before the film came out so that's Rain's number 27 fantastic voyage which i i have a lot of fun with as well so i can't argue with with that um and i'll do one more before we take a break and some music so my number 27 another big hitter really especially in the genre but godzilla the original Godzilla, the Japanese Godzilla from 1955. And uh, I think along with the original King Kong, this really defied what we now know as the disaster slash monster movie. The design, the um, the whole creature, it, it's just fantastic. Just classic, old school, practical um, design work. Brilliant um, electronics. Suspenseful moments of horror, but of course people forget it, it. It's commenting on the whole nuclear um, politics of the era, so intriguing politics too. Really, a very different film than you might expect. That's Godzilla, nineteen fifty four. My number twenty seven. So we're on to Ray's number twenty six which is The Day the Earth Stood Still, Robert Wise's original from 1951, Michael Rennie, Patricia Neal. Star and Ray says of it, one of the great journeyman directors and editor of Citizen Kane, has turned his hand to lots of different genres and often makes one of the best examples of that genre. So musicals, he of course did The Sound of Music and West Side Story, And for the horror genre, he did The Haunting. 
And f another sci-fi movie he did, which I've discussed before in the show, Star Trek The Motion Picture, the original Star Trek movie, um, which divides fans, I have to say, Star Trek fans particularly. Um, but anyway, Ray describes this film. He says, big Cold War film made not too long after the Soviets got the bomb in got the bomb sorry in 1949 so paranoia was running high start of the cold war one of the first of the wave of nuclear inspired sci-fi films and still one of the best an alien lands on earth and is immediately attacked by the army he is taken to the hospital and while recovering escapes and is hunted it turns out that he has a message for the people of earth um, form a sort of intergalactic united nations and tell us that if we start to threaten our other planets with our nuclear bombs, we will be destroyed. It's a serious exploration of what it will mean when humanity becomes a space-age race now that we have the ability to destroy the whole world. This cycle of films got quite silly, but this plays it straight. One of the most iconic lines of dialogue in an alien language, Kala to Barada Nikitu. The film supposedly inspired Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev to discuss the possibility of America and the Soviets uniting against an alien invasion, which suggests that maybe they didn't really understand the film. Score by Bernard Herrmann. So there you have it. The day the uh, the Earth stood still, the original film, is Ray's number 26. And my number 25... Oh, 26, sorry, I'm losing track. Donnie Darko, 2001. A modern cult classic, in my opinion. So we have this sort of coming-of-age teen drama mixed with kind of a sci-fi time travel end of the world style plot so the setup is basically you have the title character played by by jake jinhorn a very young and early jake jinhorn where he was virtually unknown and so he keeps he's he, he has psychological issues so he goes to a therapist um really an outcast at school um but then he keeps getting like dreamlike visuals of this this character called Frank dressed in a rabbit suit who basically says the world is going to end in so many days, so many hours, etc. And throughout the film, we get updates leading up to the actual day that Frank says the world will end. So Donnie, you know, has this knowledge. So he, he moves forward. He, he he finds out more about time travel, philosophy or time travel, which is this book written by this character who's called known as Grandma Death around the town. And so basically, um, he tries to find a way to prevent the end of the world. But of course, there's always, you know, this kind of... Um, it's left open in a way, or there's this tension over whether he's just elucidating if there's anything to it. We get a love story involved with the Jenna Malone character. Um, and yeah, it really stands out as quite a unique take on the theory of time travel. You get Jinhorn's performance is really outstanding. He really, It's a really sort of subtle, powerful performance. He has to balance a lot. But you get a really good a somber cast as well. Mary McDonnell has his as his mother really, you know, goes through a lot emotionally. Catherine Ross, people know her from The Graduate. She plays the therapist. Patrick um, Swayze, brilliant as the sleazy motivation motivational speaker, sort of you know playing against type, playing against his sort of persona. And Jenna Malone, who was another new new star at the time, I think is is really underrated as Donnie's girlfriend. She does a really great job. It's very likable. But yeah, it's this really peculiar mix of things, an inventive mix of like oddball black humor. There's a nice romance plot, but philosophy and tender human story as well. You get a dazzling visual style and hip 1980 soundtrack. I mean, the opening with Echo and the Bunnymen's killing Moon playing as Donnie rides in on his bike. 
one of my favourite openings to a film in recent times. Um, and it was just this insane cult hit, which became started life as a very small, like, word-of-mouth film. I remember I couldn't find it at my local cinema. I had to see it when I went to London. And then, funnily enough, the next year, when it had blown up and become much bigger, it was act they actually had a Halloween showing at my generic local cinema. So it shows you how far it came in, in a year. But it's one of those. It, it really grew as a word-of-mouth-style hit. Um... And although the director has not gone on to great things since, it is one of the most exciting debuts of the last 20 years. That is Donnie Darko from 2001, my number 26. And so we're into the top 25 now of the list. So Ray's 25, and this is an interesting pick. It's Dark Star, John Carpenter's movie from 1974, which I think was his debut film as well. Interesting choice because it's a very divisive film. Um, Dan O'Bannon in the lead role. Um, Dan O'Bannon co-wrote the script with John Carpenter when they were both students. And the first 45 minutes were filmed on 16mm as a student film. Cost just 6000 six, six They realised they had something good, so they filmed another 50, 50 minutes and then a producer saw the film and obtained the disposition rights but insisted that they cut major chunks of it and then new bits in 35 millimeter to bring it back to feature length i think this is the stuff with the alien john carpenter said of this we had what would have been the world's most impressive student film and it became the world's least impressive professional film. Um, O'Bannon went, went on to write Alien. John Carpenter went on to direct Halloween, The Thing, The Fog, plus many others. It found an audience in the 80s with VHS releases. It's a very inspiring film for young filmmakers because it obviously didn't cost much. Lots of handmade special effects. They played to their budget when they designed the alien, which is a spray-painted beach ball with claws, but they somehow managed to give him an actual personality, and this is probably the funniest sequence in the film. The film shows the mundaneness of intergalactic voyages. At one point, they have the ship's entire supply of toilet paper destroyed. The film centres around a crew of people in a spaceship named Dark Star who have been in space for 20 years and are absolutely bored stiff with each other and with everything. At one point, one of the characters forgets his own name. They are destroying unstable planets, but the bombs they use have consciousness, and so when one malfunctions and is stuck in the ship, they have to engage it in a philosophical argument about whether or not it really exists to convince it to not um, deteriorate itself. So very interesting pick. That is Ray Turner's... Number 25, which is John Carpenter's Dark Star, his first ever film. Very divisive film, as I said. So on to my number 25, and probably a rare example of a sequel being even better than its original, it's Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, from 1989. And this is, I think this is one of my favourite franchises, because all four Mad Max movies... I actually like to a certain degree, including the recent one. And yes, I know people say part three, Thunderdome is a bit pants, but it, it's a guilty pleasure. Tina Turner and all, come on, what, what's, what's not to love? But this, The Road Warrior successfully builds on what was a more simple first film. It adds to the experience the themes it expands on the universe and it becomes a much more daring darker and fun sort of anti-hero story you really get more into the mad max character and it's exciting stuff with plenty of shades of light and dark wacky characters 
and spot-on spot on, observations, some great satire in there. And as I said, one of the most consistent fran franchises, um, they did a really great job. So yeah, I think Mad Max 2 might be the best of the four movies and even better than the first film, I think. So Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior from 1981 is my number 25 and I think we'll we'll do one more and then then we'll take a quick break so Ray's Ray's number 24 is Silent Running which I did last week Doug Turnbull Bruce Stern stars possibly the first eco movie ever made he says Doug Turnbull worked on 2001 doing special effects the last remaining plants and animals have been saved and sent off into space in giant, giant domes waiting for a time when they can be reintroduced back to Earth but for commercial reasons the crew are ordered to destroy them and return to Earth. They are carrying out the orders when Freeman Lowe Dern murders his crewmates and sends the last remaining dome into deep space with the only with only himself and three robots on board. Music by Joe Joe Baez saw it as a child and it was very much the film everyone was talking about the next day at school. Everyone thought the robots were cute. <laughs> and that reminds me actually of a of a cool scene in the TV show Six Feet Under when a couple of characters are watching Silent Running and sort of bonding. So they have it. Ray's 24 is Silent Running. My number 24, Ghost in the Shell, the original Ghost in the Shell, the anime from 1995. Beautifully designed, dreamlike animation set in a dystopian cyberpunk future. It's wonderfully intense, some really great action scenes, really m remarkable considering all the subtle, quick movements of the animation. It, it's really perfect, spot on. Complex plot which kept me guessing throughout, rich themes, distinct and subtle characters. It works all the better because it leaves things open to the to the viewer's imagination, an, an absorbing and original sci-fi. Saw it at the Dukes a few years ago. It knocked my socks off, really threw me through a tailspin. A very unique film, Ghost in the Shell, the original from 1995, is my 24. We just had Silent Running from Ray's List, which was his 24. So on to my number 23, which is Solaris from 1972. And this is the original Solaris, the Russian by, version by Andrei Tchaikovsky's um, his original space thriller. It was remade by Steven Sodenberg in 2002. Actually a pretty solid remake, I thought, but very different. So the plot is that a Space Center's scientific mission um, to the pla planet Solaris stalls when three scientists fall into an emotional crisis. So we get a very dense, subtle human drama. You get really broad, ambitious themes to do with isolation, paranoia, love and the human condition. And it's just full of really broad, ambitious themes. You get some inventive, some claustrophobic sort of shots and camera angles. It's a really moving and touching drama as well. Really good chemistry between the lead performances. Um, it's a long film, it's close to three hours, but it really justifies the length because it the length is it adds to the psychology and the sense of dread that builds up and the connection between the characters. Beautiful, claustrophobic, tense, really moving performances, as I said. That's the original Solaris, my number 23. And Ray's number 23... And this is funny, you'll find out why in a minute. He's gone for E.T., so back on Spielberg, classic Spielberg. Um, everyone's favourite weepy, Ray says. Heartwarming, beautiful, actually pretty brutal at, at points. Could have been totally smaltzy, but it manages not to be. It's kind of irresistible. You can't help but get swept up in, in, all, in it all. It has breathtaking, iconic moments when the bikes cycle in front of the moon when E.T.'s finger glows. 
stranded alien on Earth befriends a small boy, the government agents are looking for E.T. In 1983, it became the highest grossing film of all time. It was only beaten by Jurassic Park in 1993, another Spielberg film. In 2001, Spielberg tinkered with it and added CGI stuff of E.T. and few other bits here and there. It replaced guns with um, which the federal agents were carrying with walkie-talkies. And that's Ray's number 23, E.T. And I said it was funny, and it's because great minds think alike, because my next pick is is E.T. as well, number 22, E.T. the extraterrestrial. So Ray had it at 23. I kid you not, it's my number at 22. So a crossover straight away. So Ray said it all, really, Heart, heartwarming family epic. Another thing I would say is it defied the term Spielbergian. John Williams' main theme, brilliant, delightful, iconic moment, as Ray already mentioned, them and the moon. First film really to make the alien cute and human like. D. Wallace is the ultimate 1980s mum. It's a nicely told film with important themes. And I also love how smart Elliot is. I really like the scene, for example, where they, they, they're they at the lab and they think that E.T. has died. And Elliot realises he's alive and he's, he's telling him, you know, be quiet, be quiet, basically. Don't let, don't let them con on that you're still alive. And then he pretends when they come into the room, he's crying, pretending he's still upset to fool them into thinking E.T. is still dead. So I really like, actually, it's a proactive and smart kid in that film. But, yeah, E.T.'s brilliant, heartwarming. And it's my number 22, Ray's 23, so great minds think alike. So Ray's number 22, and I'm surprised this one isn't higher on his list, actually. He's gone for A Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick's cult film from 1971. So Malcolm, M- M- Malcolm McDowell, sorry, in probably his most famous role, Patrick McGee, Anthony Sharp, Warren Clark supporting. A violent thug is re- rehabilitated by a technique which makes him want to die whenever he gets a violent thought. Is it the future? We never know for sure, but it's certainly... I got distracted. It's certainly dystopian, Ray says. Famously violent, but the violence is so stylized that it's hard to take it quite seriously. I think the main problem with it was that it all looked like such a lot of fun that people found it in, um, palatable. It doesn't look like any other film. Slightly overexposed and like it might be shot on 16mm, which I'm fairly sure it isn't. Made quite cheaply. Serious exploitation of slang and how language may evolve over time and how young people speak differently to the older generation. That prophecy came true. So there you have it. I don't think that will be the last time that a Kubrick film appears on Ray's list, but that's his number 22, A Clockwork Orange, which may or may not appear on my list. And my number 21, the last film for me of this part, is Aliens. From 1986, the crucial part being the S on the end. This is the sequel to Ridley Scott's original. So James Cameron takes over for this second film and proves just how good he is at doing sequels because it's kind of a nice compliment to the original, but it does its own thing, which all good sequels should do. So he builds on the original universe with a very original and thrilling action epic, creates a whole army of intriguing characters. You have Paul Raisin as this kind of like untrustworthy sort of sleazy government type guy, quite an under, underrated actor actually. Some good character actors also involved. Bill Paxson's in there, the late Bill Paxson. 
Um, and a nice central mother-daughter type relationship, of course, Ripley and Newt. And that builds on the original because, of course, many people say the original alien is all, you know, it's like a metaphor for the anxiety around giving birth and all that. So really good relationship there with Ripley and Newt. Great dialogue, cool creature design, plenty of tension. I'm not You'll have to find out if I like it more than Alien, which may or may not appear later on. But my number 21 is Aliens from 1986. And the last film from Ray for this part, 21 for him. And another interesting pick, Bride of Frankenstein, directed by James Whale, 1935. Boris Karloff, of course, playing the monster. Colin Clive, um, Ernest Frensinger. Eliza Lancaster and Una O'Connor starring. So Bride of Frankenstein, Ray says, much more faithful to the book than the first film. The first film showed the creature as a lumbering moot with no thoughts. In the book, the creature is articulate and agile. In this film, Kar Karloff befriends a blind man, as in the book, and they build him a bride, which sort of happens in the book. He has learnt the power of speech and seems capable of making rational choices. I love the book and am always sad that the films have rarely even tried to be about the themes that the book is actually about. I alienation, rejection, loneliness, etc. And instead always opt for the lumbering killing brute. But this seemed to be at least trying to rectify that somewhat. Um, Lenchester's bride is almost as iconic as Karloff's creature and she gave her delicate but sharp little head movements that make her look like some sort of animal crossed with a machine and that's number 21 for Ray which brings an end to this part next week we will be doing the next 10 we, we go into the top 20 but quickly I've got time for our TV movies of the week Ray has gone for a film called In of the Six Six Happiness and he says this is in honour of my friend Joe who loves this film and introduced me to it many many years ago um so robert denout as a chinaman you've got ingrid Ing ingrid bergman sorry as a tall swedish actress playing a short cockney woman kurt jargons as a german based on a true story when china is attacked by japan during the second world war a cockney missionary gladys hart Anna Wood, sorry, leads a bunch of orphans out of the province of Langshin to the next province where the trucks are waiting to take them to safety. But she only has three weeks to get them through the jungle, avoiding the Japanese. So if you want to check it, that out, it's In of the Six Happiness. It's on film for Friday, 11 a.m. Um, yeah, at 11 a.m., He's got 2.40 p.m. for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. But anyway, 11 a.m. Um, for In of the Six Happiness. And my TV movie of the week, very quickly, possibly Christopher Nolan's best film, Memento from 2000. This twisty, turny, stylish thriller. Guy Pearce in the lead role. A man suffering from short-term memory loss from a head injury, Shelby attempts to figure out who has murdered his wife using photographs and he puts no notes on the back and also has marks and notes on his body in tattoo form. Pierce's note perfect, excellent support from Carrie Ann Moss, Joe Pantolino. It's full of tension, psychology, rich character drama, great thriller, makes the audience questions every little plot development as all good thrillers should do memento from 2000 my tv movie of the week which you can see on sunday the 8th of december at a quarter past midnight on bbc one that's memento